Hi everyone, I'm Sharmila and this is the first lecture for the Australasian Debate Training Initiative. In this lecture, we will be covering the basics of the Asian's parliamentary debating format. But before that, let's chat a little bit about debating as an activity and why this might be something that interests you. So, did you know that the fear of public speaking is one of the most common forms of anxiety across cultures and across generations? This is regularly validated in surveys. Some people experience mild nervousness at the thought of speaking in public. Some, though, experience fear and panic, so much so that they dread the idea of it or even just try to avoid doing it altogether. If you conquer this fear, or at least learn how to manage it, you unlock a lot of professional and personal benefits. And this is true across all disciplines. It is as true for tech or medicine as it is for politics or business. The ability to communicate effectively the importance of your work, to organize your thoughts, to use clear and compelling language to describe what it is you do is an asset. It's an asset across all fields. Imagine being on stage or facing a job interview panel or a university admissions committee or even trying to persuade funders or people who disagree with you and not experiencing panic, not freezing, but actually feeling some nervous excitement. Imagine being able to speak clearly and confidently in high pressure situations. For some of us, debating was an important part in getting there. Another life-changing benefit debating has had for me and many other people is the scale of the global relationships and friendships we've built. Debating is not just about being in a room, sitting across another team and trying to disprove their arguments, although that is a part of it. Many debating events also have participants from all over your city or your country or even the world. And outside actual debates, you have an opportunity to form real connections with people from different backgrounds because now you share something with each other. Um, I'm a gender studies scholar but I have many close friends who are doctors, lawyers, teachers, economists, artists, engineers, and increasingly a growing number of politicians whom I've met through debating and I'm unlikely to have met otherwise. In fact, even a lot of what I know about the world, I did not just get from reading books, but I also got from conversations with interesting and clever people. So when I moved to Australia to start my master's, it was debaters who explained to me the importance of sports in Australian cultural and social life. My first baseball game in the US, it was a debater who took me, Alfred Snyder. When I moved to the UK to start my PhD, debaters helped me navigate through the education system and gave me a crash course on British politics and Brexit. If I need food recommendations or travel recommendations, or I want to know what people are reading, or even if there's something I read on the news that doesn't make sense to me and I want more context, I'm fairly confident I can look through my debate friend list and I'll find someone to consult. So that's been really valuable socially as well as professionally. Now, of course, just like any skill or hobby, debating does require some work. Um, but this work does not have to be dry and boring all the time. The most important thing in debating is really logic and having a general awareness of the world. So having a general knowledge base. This means being reasonably familiar with uh, major current events and having some grounding in world history. It means being able to be able to and being willing to uh, look at things critically and logically but it does not require being an expert on everything or anything for that matter. And there is now a very wide global network of um, debaters who are more than willing to help out younger and newer debaters. And, and this initiative is one of those things. 
we do cover a wide range of topics as well um, in debates. So we talk about economics and policies like trade and wages. We talk about criminal justice and legal reform, also about politics and international relations. At the same time, we talk about movies, sports, pop culture, and even you know personal values and personal relationships or people's personal practices. So one of my favorite topics is one that asks you to imagine that you are a talented young adult on the verge of making career decisions, which, you know, resonates with many of us. And the two options you're presented with are choosing your passion, which might not be very financially lucrative, or settling for a higher paying job, but that is more stressful, um, but having more financial security, which again is a choice I'm sure many of us can relate to. Now, one question I used to regularly ask when I was starting out in debating, and it's a question I encounter a lot from newer debaters now is, why do I have to defend something I don't agree with? And so this is something I really disliked when I was younger. At the same time, when I look back, I actually realize how important it is to learn to get out of your intellectual comfort zone and to be conscious of your own biases and to critically interrogate them as well. So all those instances where I've had to defend things I didn't necessarily agree with personally actually helped me see things from a different perspective. And now in my personal relationships or even in my professional life, I found it a lot easier to assume the best version of the arguments I don't agree with because of this training behind me. And the debate topics we encounter are likely to be quite balanced and quite fair, and they're likely to tackle controversial issues for which there is no real correct answer. And that's why it becomes even more valuable to be willing to explore this issue from different perspectives. And this has taught me to be open. It's taught me to realize that in complicated situations, perhaps I do not always have all the answers. And I've been more willing to change my mind when confronted with a better argument or a better set of facts. That's been valuable personally. That's also the kind of society we want to build in. Finally, debating has been quite the safe space to explore controversial issues. So I come from a community that is a bit more traditional, a bit more patriarchal, and I'm sure some of you can relate to this, where questions of marriage or sexuality or religion are considered settled topics and uh, there isn't much value accorded to critical public discourse. So in these settings, debating was one of the very rare opportunities to actually challenge these ideas, but still in a safe space and to meet other people who were also willing to think more critically about these things. And in that sense, it has been a valuable personal outlet too. Um, so now that I've explained all those things to you, perhaps you'd understand why the rest of us on this team are really, really excited about sharing, debating with everyone else. So as I've said in this lecture, we will be talking about the Asian parliamentary format. Now this format is similar to the World Schools Debating Championship and the Austral Asian InterVarsity Debating Championship format, but with some slight differences. It's also a bit similar to the British parliamentary debating format, which is used in the world championships, but that one is a bit more different. That one has four teams. The Asians format just has two teams in every round, one on each side. Um, and in later lectures, we're also gonna talk to you about those other formats so you can compare and contrast better. Before moving on to the next section, I'm gonna make you watch a short clip of a debater speaking. Um, just to give you a quick sense of what it looks like, pay close attention to the topic and to how this speaker defines the key words in the topic, as well as some of the arguments that they provide in defense of the topic. In World War II, 
France collaborate with the Nazi regime so that part of the Nazi dominion is controlled by them. These are the type of behaviors that we are against in opening government. Because in opening government, we believe that when there are oppression, your duty as an identity group is not to be a collaborator, betraying your own group and betraying your own people that will be abused day to day, but to stand in opposition to the atrocities of the regime. We say that we must revolt, we must fight back, and we think that this is what is moral to do. We're going to prove what should be the moral standard in fighting oppression, and I'm going to talk about three things. Number one, I'm going to begin by talking about who's the beneficiary of the collaboration. Number two, I'm going to explain what's the comparative if we choose not not to collaborate at all. And number three, lastly, why the comparative, the trade-off at the end of the day is something that's worth it. Let's begin with who is the beneficiary of the collaboration. I'm going to begin by dispelling the myth that being a collaborator will make your identity group better off because we say that that's a lie. You are not going to be better off as an identity group. Why is this the case? How do evil regimes work? How do evil regimes oppress people, ladies and gentlemen? You need to understand that as an evil regime, your end goal is to seek for profit. You plunder resources. And this is something inherent that at the end of the day, all evil regimes will always put fear on these identity groups by continuously killing them so that they are afraid of revolting and taking back power to the hands of the people. That evil regime will always force many of the oppressed groups to be a forced labor, working for free, guaranteeing that their oppression machine can continue. So the question is, who benefit? Because we will concede that there might be a moderation of the oppression, but the question is, who will be the beneficiary of that moderation? We say that the beneficiary will be exclusive to the well connected. The leaders of the minority group, those that are rich, those that are privileged, those that held the seats of power, like the nobles, for example. We say that these are people who are privileged enough, and we say that it is unlikely that the moderation of oppression will any be different, right? Why is this something inherent? Obviously, because if you as a leader, even if you choose to be a collaborator, even if you choose to push less and less discrimination and less and less abuse, we say that it is impossible that the regime will ever follow you and to choose to extend the moderation to other people who are not part of the privilege. Why? Number one. Because at that point, the regime are unable to benefit fully from the oppression, right? Because when they choose to oppress your people, when they choose to acquire all those free labor, if they choose to no longer do it, then they take away the biggest source of their profit. But secondly, note that in the event that they choose to comply with you, that they have less and less oppression coming to your people, then they will feel that their authority is threatened, right? It is beginning to be taken away by you at the end of the day. That, that's why they are unlikely to be able and to want to comply and reduce the amount oppression. What is the meaning of all this? The meaning is that it is something inherent within every collaboration that the most vulnerable will keep on getting oppressed. And I think that there are lots of study cases for this, right? When Indonesian nobles made deals with Japan, Your the oppression what? happens at the end of the day. The abuse continues to happen to the poor Indonesians and it is only the nobles that are free. We think that at that point, the beneficiary is extremely, extremely limited and exclusive to a certain set of people. Before I move on, yes. I think it's highly uncomparative because I believe in their side of the house, there will be more fear, more oppression, and they'll be highly more likely to be violent to them. I prefer my side of the house. Be comparative, please. Yeah, what's the comparative, right? Let's move to my second argument. The comparative is taking the fight to them. Be a freedom fighter. And the first thing that I would like to talk about is why it can work. Because we're not, we're not going to say that it's going to be an easy fight and you're going to win in a matter of days. We can see it's not going to be an easy fight and there will be lots of blood involved. But the comparative in this debate is on the probability of success, ladies and gentlemen. Because what you need to understand is that the probability of success if you do this is significantly much higher, right? Why? Number one, because you can seek for alliances. Because now there's a message of you fighting oppression together with other groups that are oppressed as well. You are not seen as a group that used to betray the other oppressed group to the oppressor, but you are seen as a group that are saying no to the moral deprivation of the oppressor. It means that you say no to the regime as a whole. And we think that when you join together with many other oppressed groups, there are many strategies that you can have, right? Despite the asymmetry of the power between you and the oppressor, we think that the strategies are always there. Guerrilla warfare, for example, hiding in plain sight. We think that the Vietnam is a good example of success of such type of warfare. We don't see why it cannot be done again. But the second thing that is the most important 
is that you don't actively empower the regime, ladies and gentlemen. What you need to understand is that when you choose to become a collaborator, the probability of success of ending oppression is significantly less because you are going to continuously empower the regime at the end of the day. And this is a trade off that opposition bench must accept, right? Because when you choose to collaborate, you need to give something to the regime so that your own ass is safe. And it means that you are going to be giving things that are making the regime stronger. How do you generally collaborate? You give your resources, ladies and gentlemen. You give more and more people to their labor camp. You give capital that increases their strength at the end of the day. In World War II, for example, a pressure from Japan got stronger because of the provision of oil and police force in the Romusha, for example, making defeating them significantly harder at the end of the day. And that's the type of rate of, ladies and gentlemen, that they have. A regime that's continuously oppressing and is significantly much stronger at the end of the day. So in this section, we will be talking about the structure of an Asian's parliamentary debate, and we'll be covering certain important features of this format, like points of information, motions, speaker roles. We'll do a quick overview of how debates are judged and what criteria judges use. And then we'll look ahead to the future of this lecture series. And we will also talk a little bit about how you can start leveling up as a debater. Okay. In terms of the structure of an Asian parliamentary debate, so there are two teams per round. They are called the government and opposition teams, sometimes called proposition and opposition. Each team has three speakers. So the first six speeches are seven minutes each. Those are the prime minister, leader of opposition, deputy prime minister, deputy leader of opposition, government whip, and opposition whip speeches. The last two speeches are called reply speeches, and they are only four minutes each. Replies are delivered by any of the first two speakers of the team, so the whips cannot deliver reply speeches. And in this format, the opposition reply goes first. So the government has the first and the last say, but the opposition does have a powerful opposition block where the opposition whip and the reply can speak af uh, one after the other. Uh, in this format, there is an odd number of adjudicators usually, and each judge gets one vote each. So points of information are very important in this format. They make the debates a lot more exciting and engaging. So you don't have to listen to an entire speech without being able to respond or engage with the speaker because you can do so in the middle of their speech, right? So for the first six speeches, um, members of the opposing team can offer points of information to the person speaking. POIs can be raised between the first and sixth minute of your opponent's speeches. However, the speaker who has the floor has the discretion to accept or reject these points of information. So they get to decide at what point in their speech um, it makes sense for them to receive points of information. Um, we do not allow points of information in reply speeches. POIs last for a maximum of 15 seconds, but of course they can be shorter than that as well. A POI can be a clarification if something is unclear in what the speaker is saying, or proposing, it can be a question, it can be a direct refutation, it can also be a reminder of an argument that you're, you have raised previously that you feel isn't being responded to, um, and points of information must be offered respectfully. So while we say you can offer it anytime between the first and the sixth minute of your opponent's speeches, um, if you are turned down by the speaker, if the speaker says, sorry, not now, or I'll take you later, it would be good if the entire team can wait, say, 15 or 20 seconds before you offer a point again so you don't end up distracting the speaker or being disrespectful. All right, um, motion. So the motion is the topic to be debated. The government defends the motion and the opposition opposes it. Motions begin with this house and they are formulated in different ways. So some examples would be this house believes that, this house would, this house supports, and later you'll see a few examples of motions. Um, motions cover controversial topics with no correct sides. So as we've discussed, Part of the beauty of debating is that we're dealing with issues where there is no clear correct answer, there is no clear moral answer, um, and there are valid arguments to be made on both sides and very real trade-offs uh, to be discussed. So that's reflected in the motion. A set of three motions will be released by the chief judges for every debate round. So the two teams in each round agree on which motion they will debate. In the next lecture, we will be talking to you 
in detail about this process of ranking motions and agreeing on the final motion for the debate. There will be a 30 minute prep period before the debate, so both teams independently prepare the motion. This for their side. This means that members of every team are not allowed to consult anyone outside their team. You're also not allowed to access electronic materials. You can make use of print materials if you have them in prep time, but you may not have them with you as you are delivering your speech. So these things, violations of this will be considered cheating. Now, sometimes along with a motion, Chief judges also release information slides or context slides. So these are given only when necessary. So not every motion will have them. And once you have an info slide or a context slide, you must assume the information in this slide to be true for purposes of the debate. So both the motion and the info slide is binding. The purpose of these additional items is usually to either define key terms, especially if they're not very clear, just to bring clarity to the debate, to avoid confusion between both teams, um, and to provide knowledge necessary for a functional debate. Now, if there is a word or words that are unclear to you, you may ask the chief judges for a clarification. They are required to define the words for you because, you know, um, the access to the English language should not be the basis that, on which debates are decided, but they, of course, cannot provide you with arguments or they cannot advise you on strategic decisions to make in the debate. And the motion should be defined in the first proposition speech. So in a few minutes, we will be talking about what a definition is, what a fair definition looks like. Okay, let's now go on to speaker roles. So as we said, the government side has the prime minister, the deputy prime minister, the government whip and the government reply. And you have the opposite of that on the opposition side. So the prime minister is the first speaker of the debate. Sometimes I might refer to the prime minister as the PM. So the PM defines the motion. We'll talk about that very soon. Sets up the debate and presents arguments for their side. The leader of the opposition accepts or rejects the definition. Again, we will talk about that soon. Establishes the clash and rebuts the prime minister's argument. So a rebuttal is basically a refutation or a response to the arguments of the prime minister. So um, an art, a rebuttal basically demonstrates that the arguments of the other side are not true or perhaps not important. We'll talk about that in a bit. And of course, presents their own arguments. So the deputy prime minister then should be rebutting the opposition's arguments, defending their prime minister's arguments that were attacked and developing their own team's case. So they can do this by either providing distinctly new arguments or they could also just uh, extend, deepen, develop arguments that were made by their previous speaker. The same is true for the deputy leader of opposition, only on the flip side, the government whip and the opposition whip are meant to summarize the debate. But of course, they are not summarizing the debate in a chronological order because that would be quite inefficient and impossible. Um, what they are doing though is identifying the core themes or the core clashes of the round. And in the process, comparing their teams, their team with the other team, rebutting the arguments of the other team and defending their team's arguments. Um, government, reply and opposition reply speeches are a bit different in that they are given half marks, they also have uh, less time, and they are no longer considered um, constructive speeches. So at this point, they are not meant to be adding new material into the debate. So they are not adding new arguments, they are not adding um, new rebuttal anymore. So the value of the reply speech um, lies in something else. A good way to describe the reply speech is that it is a biased adjudication. It is almost as though you are taking the role of a judge who is assessing what transpired in the debate, except obviously you're biased because you're explaining a win for your side. Um, so in a reply speech, you sort of pretend that the debate has already transpired and you're referring to it largely in the past tense, right? So you're not adding to that debate anymore. But what you're doing is you're answering the question, why do we win? What did we do so well and what did they do badly that made us win this debate? Okay, so in terms of defining the motion, um, the definition basically clarifies key terms in the motion to ensure teams are on the same page. It should have a direct link to the motion. It needs to be fair and debatable and we will explore this in more depth later. 
It should identify the issues to be debated and the scope of the debate, and it must include parameters and limitations when necessary. So here's an example of what a reasonable definition might look like. Let's say the motion is, this house would allow people to sell their organs for money. If proposition said, we are talking entirely about blood donation and we are talking about incentivizing blood donation. This is unreasonable for opposition. It's almost, it, it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to oppose this. And this wouldn't be a valid motion. It wouldn't be fair and debatable. At the same time, the proposition side is also not expected to say uh, people should be able to sell their heart and their brains while they are still alive, even if this results in their death. Because there is widespread consensus that this would be coercive and this would be a violation of an individual's rights, right? So that is not the burden of the proposition side in this debate as well. A reasonable and fair motion, that definition that has a link to the motion would be to say things like allowing people to receive compensation for a kidney or a portion of their liver or their lungs or bone marrow. So procedures that are still medically risky and that, that may still have certain like health costs that are still reasonably invasive, but at the same time, not fatal, which leads to a balanced debate because there are accessible and fair arguments that both sides can run here. Okay. Now, another thing to keep in mind in terms of defining the motion is that the debate rests on the assumption that the action that is specified in the motion, so for example, the last one, the action of selling organs, will be taken, that it can actually happen, that it can actually be done. So in debate language, we refer to this as proposition fiat. Otherwise, if we are unable to make that assumption, then many debates cannot even happen in the first place. It's a non-starter, right? So while the government team can assume that the motion will happen, they cannot stipulate whether it's a good or a bad thing. That's something they have to prove. And they also cannot, cannot assume the way that other actors will react. So they also have to uh, prove that these reactions will be beneficial. So let's uh, review an example for this. Let's say the motion is this house would reserve a third of the seats for women in parliament. It is not legitimate for opposition to say male parliamentarians will not let this bill in parliament pass. Um, you have to assume that it will pass. Otherwise, the debate can't even happen, right? But it is legitimate for them to say that this policy is unfair and illegitimate. It is legitimate for them to say that the women who are elected might not represent women's causes adequately. It is legitimate for them to say that women elected will not be seen as credible. All of these are valid lines for opposition, but they need to assume that it will happen. All right, now let's talk about fairness questions in defining the motion. So there are five things to keep in mind in defining the motion fairly. One, proposition must choose the obvious meaning of the motion. Squirreling refers to the distortion of a motion into a definition that violates the intended meaning. And squirreling is not allowed. It is unfair because it does not give opposition adequate time to anticipate or prepare for the motion. So they, they will be shocked by this unexpected definition, which is not fair. So for example, if your motion is, this house would ban gambling, you cannot say something like, we will ban people gambling with their lives. Therefore, we will ban things like hard drugs, which are dangerous to people. Gambling has an obvious meaning, which means staking money or staking something of value on the outcomes of a game, on the outcomes of an event uh, that, are, that is determined purely by chance. So that is, the, that is what the debate should be about. Otherwise, it would be a squirrel. Second, the definition must allow the opposition room for debate. So, of course, the proposition side may suggest parameters or models or criteria. We'll talk about those in a little bit about for judging the debate, but they must be reasonable and they must not restrict the motion arbitrarily. Um, so a truism is not allowed. A truism is when the debate is defined on an issue where an overwhelming majority of people accept a certain side as a truth, right? And so therefore the debate is no longer balanced or fair. So for example, if the motion is, this house supports cosmetic surgery, it is not okay to say, we support cosmetic surgery only for you know, individuals who have suffered from serious accidents or 
uh, burned victims or individuals with body dysphoria. One, they are not representative of the general population. Two, it would be very hard to argue for cosmetic surgery in those situations. It's even arguable if it is still cosmetic in that situation, right? So this debate still, the debate has to be broadened and expanded to a wider uh, set of cases. At the same time, it is legitimate for the proposition side to say, we support cosmetic surgery for adults. Uh, it's a very different debate when we are talking about children because the discussion of consent and rationality when it comes to children is a bit different. That's a legitimate parameter and that's a legitimate restriction. And that still leaves room for a fair debate. Um, third, the definition must match the level of abstraction or specificity of the motion. So if there is a specific context the chief adjudicators will specify that. And sometimes they do. You sometimes get motions with proper nouns, but not always, right? Um, so for example, if you get the motion, this house would ban commercial surrogacy. It is not legitimate for a proposition team to say, we're only gonna ban it for low income countries because individuals um, are operating under duress and can't make a fair choice. That is not a fair interpretation of the motion. The debate has to apply to all countries or most countries. Um, Low-income countries can be used as an example, but it cannot be the only scope of the debate. Fourth, proposition must not place set the debate if no specific place is specified. In this case, it must be assumed again that the motion applies to a majority of cases. So um, the previous example could also illustrate this. However, at the same time, if the motion says um, this house believes that only democratic countries should be allowed to host international sporting events, it would then be uh, legitimate for the proposition to define what the democracy is broadly and say that using these general features of a democracy, um, certain countries that don't conform to it will not be allowed to host. Um, Finally, the motion must be defined in the present unless otherwise stated. So, for example, you get the motion, this house would permit lethal autonomous weapons in warfare. It is not legitimate to say, this is something we will allow 20 years from now when the technology is perfect. The debate is happening here and now, so you must set it up now or in the very near future. Um, if you get the motion, this house um, believes that citizens should engage in civil disobedience to protest unjust laws. It is not legitimate to simply talk about South Africa during the apartheid era. You can use that as an example, but you're gonna have to talk about the debate in the present. However, if the retrospective context is built into the motion, so for example, if the motion says, this house believes that NATO <clears throat> should not have withdrawn its troops, from Afghanistan, then it is legitimate for you to set the debate to uh, 2011 to 2012 or thereabouts, because that's around the time these decisions were being debated um, about withdrawing uh, a, a large chunk of troops from, from Afghanistan. So what happens if, the def if proposition's definition is unfair? What if it violates uh, some of the rules that we've talked about, right? Like what if, let's say the motion was, you know, this house believes that national security is more important than civil liberties. And then you have a proposition team that says, today we only wanna talk about national ID cards, which is an invalid definition. ID cards can be an, a subset of this, an example of this policy, but it cannot be the entire debate, right? What happens then? So. In that situation, the opposition team has the option to challenge. They are not required to challenge because sometimes even if it's a squirrel, it's still debatable and it might actually be good to just debate it, but they definitely have this option. Now, a definitional challenge can only be done by the leader of opposition. So if the LO does not do this, no one else can. And the definition as set by the PM stands. Um, it has to be officially and explicitly declared, and it obviously has to be justified. So the leader of opposition needs to point to any of those previous standards or criteria that I mentioned as a basis for the challenge. And of course, because they are saying that this definition is invalid, they then need to provide a new definition and tell us what should have been the correct definition for the debate. 
Now, unless the motion is a truism, which means like opposition has no room to argue, and this is why definitional challenges get quite messy, both teams under the rules still need to present arguments under their definitions, obviously, but also they need to assume, even if the other side's definition was correct, they also then need to pre present arguments under the other side's definition. So if you are opposition, you are opposing proposition's illegal definition and your own new definition. Uh, your own new motion um, that you have defined. So you're essentially running two different cases on both teams. Um, and this is why you can see why challenges are discouraged because they are a lot harder to judge and, you know, they make the debates messier, but they are allowed because um, of fairness. All right. Um, so in general, there are two types of motions, and this will be covered in more depth in the succeeding lectures. But for purposes of this lecture, it's helpful to think of the two types as policy motions and judgment motions. So let's talk about policy motions first. So policy motions require the proposition team to carry out an action. The most common form of a policy motion is this house would. Sometimes it can also be this house supports an action, right? So when you are faced with a policy motion, the proposition may use a model or a policy, but this must be explained in the first speech. This shouldn't be, you know, brought out in the second or in the last speech, right? Um, ev uh, everyone in the debate must know what model is at stake in the round. And when this happens, opposition can propose a counter model. And if they do, then the motion becomes proposition model versus opposition model. And obviously not all models require the same level of elaborateness and same level of detail. And this is something we will discuss in the second lecture. So for example, if your motion is banning smoking, this is fairly straightforward, like you gradually ban tobacco-based products. And it's quite likely that the opposition side here will propose a counter model, which is, do we really have to ban it? Can't we just regulate it? Like make sure that minors don't smoke, heavily regulate advertising and sale, perhaps provide um, rehabilitation assistance to individuals who would like to quit, impose sin, sin taxes, maybe. So these are things that opposition can do. Having said that though, it is important to note that opposition is not required to have a counter model. As long as they provide reasons to not do the policy, which is their primary job and duty as the opposition, then a point of disagreement is already made here, right? So these usually come in the form of proving uh, that the policy will make the situation worse, or by proving that at the moment there's already a solution present and proposition's proposal just worsens the situation. All right. Um, some policy motions uh, already make clear what the opposition has to implement in the motion itself. So the comparison is already built into the motion. So for example, this house would require nonviolent criminals to perform community service rather than go to prison. So in this case, opposition doesn't really have freedom to shop around for different models, right? They cannot say, oh, just house arrest or fines. Uh, the motion clearly specifies that they need to defend prison while the prop needs to defend community service. Um, another thing to note is that opposition's model must be mutually exclusive to propositions, even if they share some elements. Now, the word mutually exclusive is like intimidating sometimes. All it really means is that the two models cannot happen at the same time, right? So for example, if the motion is, this house would make voting mandatory. So we fine or we punish people who don't vote, right? Both sides can have voter education. That's something they can share, that's okay. So therefore that's not exclusive. But what is exclusive is one side has mandatory voting and the other side has optional voting. You don't punish people who don't vote. And therefore the debate now rests on why it is necessary to make it mandatory or optional. And like I said, the next lecture will provide a deeper discussion on models. Now, judgment motions. Some motions do not require a policy or a model. Instead, they simply require debaters to argue about whether something is more harmful or more beneficial, or whether we are better off without this something, right? So here are some examples of judgment motions. This house opposes the belief that forgiveness is a virtue, or 
this house believes that awards have done more harm than good for the film industry, or this house prefers benevolent dictatorships to weak democracies. So none of these motions are asking, is asking anyone to do anything. Uh, no one is banning awards. No one is, you know, proposing to abolish democracy. This is simply an evaluation of things, right? And for most of the, for some, for some of these motions, it is important to imagine what an alternative world would look like without the thing that we are evaluating. So let's say the first motion, right? Um, what would the world look like if forgiveness were not regarded as a virtue? What would that imaginary alternative world look like? Why is that world potentially a better place than a world where forgiveness is a virtue? Or why might it be a worse place is the debate. Okay. Now, let's talk about arguments and rebuttal, but largely in reference to speaker roles. This is because we are going to have a third lecture that focuses in depth on arguments and rebuttal. So for purposes of this introduction, uh, it's important to keep in mind that after defining the motion and explaining um, their position in the debate, which the first two speakers will be doing, both teams need to provide arguments and rebuttal to defend their side and to attack the other side. So an argument, to put it simply, is a reason why you support or oppose the motion. And the first four speakers are expected to provide and develop arguments. Now, third speakers, or the whips, are expected to defend existing arguments, but they are not supposed to raise new ones because this would be unfair because the other teams, other speakers don't really have an opportunity to respond anymore. So whips may bring in new examples and they can weigh and compare the value of existing arguments against each other, which in itself is a very important contribution to the debate already. Um, so that's arguments. A rebuttal or refutation is a response to the other side's material. It is meant to show that the other side's arguments are untrue, right? Or that even if they are true, that they are less important or that they are less relevant than your own arguments. So either of those is a rebuttal. Now, all speakers except the prime minister, who obviously has no one to rebut, and the reply speakers must provide rebuttal. Now, as I've said earlier, reply speeches cannot introduce new arguments or rebuttal on the motion. They just reflect the material that's already been presented. So no new arguments for the motion, but they can make arguments for why their team should win based on what's already out there. All right. Um, now, who is the judge that you will encounter in uh, this format? And before we talk about the criteria for judging, it might be helpful for you to know uh, how we instruct the judges in this format as well. So judges in this format are meant to be impartial. They don't judge teams that they have a personal bond with. So if they're from your um, college or they're from your school, or if they have coached you before, or if they have a relationship with you in the past or the present, then they can't judge you. Judges are also meant to be unbiased. So they have no prior idea who is going to win the debate. They don't go into the round thinking, I think this is easier for one side or, oh, this is a more experienced team. So I kind of expect them to win the round or I saw this team in a previous tournament. I think they're quite good. So I'm expecting them to do well. So none of those things um, should be in the judge's mind as they enter the debate. They must erase all of those thoughts. So they set aside their personal opinion about the motion or specific arguments. So even if they don't agree with a motion or with one side, that's irrelevant. They have to be open-minded when they enter the debate. Um, they also don't expect teams to argue their own pet arguments. Um, they judge the debate as it happened before them. Judges are instructed to take down notes. So they are observant, they are diligent, they listen to what debaters say. Um, they don't complete arguments for you. So, And at the same time, they also don't step in and refute the arguments of teams. They wait for the other side to do it, right? Um, they have uh, the knowledge of someone who regularly reads the front pages and world section of a high quality newspaper. So they are your average global citizen. So they're not like fools. They do have a general knowledge base. They have a grounding in world history. So they're intelligent people, but they are not specialists, right? So they are not, you know, trained economists or trained lawyers or trained doctors. So they do not bring in specialist knowledge or expertise. 
in a certain field and they are not familiar with technical vocabulary. So you must speak to them with um, accessible conversational vocabulary. And they, but of course they know the rules of debating. Now, what are the three criteria for judging um, in the Asian parliamentary format? So we look at three things. We look at matter, manner, and method. In this lecture, we're just gonna talk about the criteria, but there will be a separate lecture that talks in detail about um, judging and the trickier issues of judging, right? Now, these three um, criteria, matter, manner, and method are interconnected. So let's talk about matter first. So matter refers to the content of the speech. So this is basically the arguments, the rebuttal, the points of information that you offer and the way you respond to points of information that are offered to you. Um, and so we look at things like the rigor of your logic, right? The links made within your argument, the fact that the conclusions are well supported and well argued. And this is done beyond face value because it's one thing to say that something is true or that something is important, but it's another to actually prove it. Um, and here judges then look at the quality of your analysis and your examples. They also look at the relative importance of your material because the material might be interesting and exciting, but it might not be relevant or important. And they track the evolution of your material. So are you able to respond to responses from the other side? Are you able to defend your arguments that were attacked by the other side? Um, falls under matter. Method refers to um, the structure, the timing, and the technical presentation of a speech. So individual method refers to the timing and organization of a, of a speaker's speech. Did you allocate enough time to responding and building your own material? Did you leave the more important argument for last such that you didn't have time to, you know, prove it or explain it well and that might count against you? Um, team method refers to the flow and consistency of the speakers um, in a team. So are you supporting each other? Are your arguments clashing with each other? Are you disagreeing with each other? Um, falls under method as well, but you can see how um, this is very interconnected with manner. Um, in, sorry, matter. Um, in terms of manner, so manner is the presentation of the speech. It is the style a speaker uses to persuade the judges of their content. It's very, very important. I cannot stress enough. Um, that to, to recognize that there is no one correct style of debating. There are examples of excellent speaking styles um, and excellent speakers across cultures and genders. So we encourage you to find your own style that works for you. We encourage you to experiment. What you want to be is the best version of your own personal style, not to mimic someone else's style. So Manner is about body language and gestures, if this is applicable. Of course, it's a bit harder in a world where debating is online, but hopefully this is temporary. Um, it's about vocal presentation. So changes in your speaking speed, changes in your pace and volume. Are you pausing for rhetorical or dramatic effect? Changes in tone to match your content. Um, your choice of accessible and evocative words in proving an argument. So if the words are too technical and highfalutin, um, that's not going to be effective. At the same time, if the words are too imprecise, that's unlikely to be effective too. Um, appropriate use of emotion and humor, uh, the use of examples that carry a particular emotional resonance, how you establish a connection or some rapport with your audience. Now, it's important to note that manner is not about uh, the perceived harshness or pleasantness of an accent. If an accent sounds foreign or familiar to you, that is irrelevant. It is not about the immutable characteristics of a speaker's voice or the pitch of their voice. It's not about the size of a speaker's note cards either. Um, manner matters because uh, public speaking is an inextricable part of debating. Otherwise, we would just be writing essays, right? So debating encompasses an entire skill set. Logic is important. Delivery and presentation are also important. It's important in this craft to maintain your audience's attention, to establish credibility as a speaker, to make them sympathetic to your claims. And that's where manner comes in. All right, very briefly, this is the scoring range that is used to judge you. 
The lowest score is 67, the highest score is 81. These scores are very rare. Most of the common scores happen within the 70 to 80 range. 75 is your average speech. And of course, reply speeches get half marks. So you score reply speech the way you would a normal speech and then you divide it by two. I don't want to go into too much detail about the scoring range because this is something we will bring back when we talk about the um, judging lecture, but at least you are familiar with the range at this point. Okay, what can you expect then from this lecture series in the coming weeks? Our next topic is on case building, and we will be talking to you about maximizing preparation time. So those 30 minutes that you have after you see a motion and building a case. We'll also be talking to you about constructing arguments, rebuttal and engagement, and many, many more. What should you do to get better at this stage? This is a question we will continue to address with every lecture, but at this stage, here are my suggestions for you. I think it's important to watch all our future lectures. I think it's important for you to be intellectually curious. Debating is not about memorizing the encyclopedia or knowing all the possible facts you can find in your almanac. It is simply about thinking about the world critically and using logic to solve intellectual puzzles or intellectual problems. So it's important to read widely. It's important to be well versed in current events and historically important events. Wikipedia has a bad reputation, but actually it's really, really helpful. If you come across something that you're not very familiar with, but that strikes you, strikes you as interesting, just look it up on Wikipedia, which gives you great background information, and then work your way up from there and review the bibliography and consult those sources. But also, you don't just need to read the newspaper or The Economist all the time. Debating is really about thinking about things critically. So even your personal experiences, your relationships, um, your personal desires, you know, to just like interrogate these things and think about them carefully. Uh, when you're watching sports or when you're watching a film or when you're trying to appreciate art, there are a lot of like, you know, interesting, contentious issues around these activities that are worth thinking about. Um, it's also helpful to start watching videos of debates online, and we will be sharing with you a list of potentially useful uh, debates that you can draw on. Do some practice debates with your debating society and discuss them after. Um, we suggest investing at least two to three hours a week on this activity, and obviously you are welcome to do more. Um, and of course, look forward to joining debating competitions in the future, including those hosted by this initiative. Finally, every lecturer shares with you what they are reading for the week. And this week I am reading Living a Feminist Life by Sarah Ahmed. I think it's a really interesting book. It shows how feminist theory can emerge from everyday experiences at home and in work. And it does, discusses the figure of the feminist killjoy um, and provides practical tools for how to live a feminist life, no matter how challenging that is. Um, and I found it to be quite an interesting read. If you're interested in gender studies um, or just feminism in general, I'd encourage you to pick this up. 